All right, welcome to our introductory lecture to migration. The slides are designed to accompany an AP Human Geography book called The Cultural Landscape. So it's not our textbook, but it does cover a lot of the same stuff. So hopefully there'll be some new stuff in here too for you. I'm of course Miss Gall and I'll be your lecturer for today. So the first thing you got to know about migration is that migration is a type of mobility. Um, and specifically it's mobility to a, a permanent move to a new location. Migration is relocation to fusion. And so if you remember when we were talking about diffusion in the last unit, we talked about um, relocation to fusion as being literally picking up and moving from one place to another. That's what it is. Okay. It's when you pick up and move and you take all of your culture and everything else with you to the new place. On a very broad level, we can break migration into two categories, and these were on your vocab list if I remember correctly. So um, we've got emigration, which is migration out of a place, and immigration, which is migration into a place. Just to give you an example, I emigrated out of Alaska to move to Washington, and I immigrated into Bellingham when I moved down here. <clears throat> so talk about why do people migrate? A lot of reasons why people migrate, but most people migrate for economic reasons because they're seeking out better opportunities. Okay, and put a star next to it, highlight it, underline it, circle it, whatever you're going to do to let yourself know that you need to know what push and pull factors are. Okay, um, these will absolutely appear on the chapter three quiz, they'll appear on the unit two test, they will probably find their way onto the AP test in May. They're that important. And these are the geographic reasons why people move where they do. Okay, um, push factors are literally things that push you out of a place that make you want to leave it. It's the why you left a given place. There's your geographic question. Okay, and pull factors are why you chose to move into a given place. Okay, and that's also your geographic question for, for pull factors. Sometimes push and pull factors can be the same general thing. For instance, there are a lot of people um, who hate the weather here in Seattle in the winter, right? It's rainy, it's overcast, it's gray, it's a little bit cold. Um, and as you get older, that gets a little bit harder to deal with, in particular as you get older. But um, So that would be a push factor, encouraging people to leave, right? The weather would be the push factor. Then you get people who will, so they might live up here in Seattle in the spring, summer, early fall when it's green and it's beautiful and it's, the temperature's relatively mild. Um, but then they move somewhere else for the winter, like say Arizona, New Mexico, Florida, Southern California, someplace like that. So in that case, then the weather is going to be the pull factor. It's going to be what made them choose that particular location, right? That it's warm in the winter, that it's dry, that it's sunny, those kinds of things, weather and climate. Okay. Um, economic push factors. If you have a location where there's not good job opportunities, versus economic pull factors where there are much better economic opportunities. So if you're not making the wage you want or able to get the job you want in a given location, you might move to a different location to be able to secure that, that better opportunity. There are also cultural push and pull factors, right? So um, push factors could be forced migration, right? Could be slavery, could be a refugee situation, <clears throat> right? And refugees, this is another one of your vocab words. Uh, refugees are people who leave an area because of some kind of persecution. It could be political, it could be social, right? Could be hardcore, could be war, right? A lot of times you see refugees in war zones, um, but they're choosing, they basically feel like they've been forced out. We could see uh, ethnic cleansing falls under forced migration. By the way, somebody, I think it was somebody in 1A asked, what is the difference between ethnic cleansing and genocide. Genocide is when you kill people to get them out of an area. Ethnic cleansing includes genocide, but it's also though it could also it also includes those nonviolent acts like passing laws that say you can't follow the religion you want or you can't wear the clothing you want or um, or maybe that you've traditionally worn that you can't speak your language. Okay, that's another form of, of ethnic cleansing. There are also political push and pull factors. 
right and these are these are huge i wouldn't underestimate these although they do tend to go along with the economic ones which is to say political push factors are unstable political environments um, places where there's a lot of revolution or coups um, where the government is unpredictable or the government is super over the top dictatorial right those are push factors pull factors in terms of politics are things like a stable government, um, a predictable government. So the government doesn't even necessarily need to be all that great as long as it does the basics. And it's stable. It's consistent. Um, people know what to predict. Okay. There's also environmental push and pull factors. So for instance, we want to talk about environmental push factors. We could talk about all the flooding that's been going on in South Carolina, I guarantee you there's a lot of people who are going to be moving out of South Carolina because they can't afford to replace their homes because they didn't have flood insurance. Right, so they'll need to move to somewhere else. Um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, a lot of people moved out of New Orleans and into other areas like, say, Texas or um, other areas even of Louisiana and other areas in the south we even got folks moving as far away as Washington here again because of the hurricane and the fact that they couldn't afford to to rebuild environmental pull factors by the way would include things like um, a mild climate or um, a climate that you enjoy so maybe you don't like a ton of sun or you're allergic to sun so you go someplace where there's not going to be a lot of sun Right, or maybe you hate the rain, so you're going to go someplace where there's basically no rain. Okay, all kinds of things to really think about in terms of push and pull factors. We're looking at refugees, and this is an interesting case. I want you to pause the video for a moment, <clears throat> take a look at this map, and see what patterns you can see. And then um, start it back up after you've come up with one or two kind of things that you see. Okay, it's that level two question what patterns you see and we'll talk about what are some of the patterns and we'll talk about why that is okay so one of the first things you should notice looking at this map is that it's a flow line map which is a type of thematic map okay um, and some of the kids have said things like they notice that most of the arrows are relatively short okay or that they go out of poorer areas or areas where there's lots of conflict and into areas that are more stable which are all great things to notice and things that we um, need to account for when we're talking about refugees and we're talking about migration. Okay, One of the most important things we can talk about in terms of people moving is that people don't like to move very far. That's why even when we're talking about refugees, when they're fleeing, they're fleeing to nearby countries. <clears throat> Unless they really, really don't feel safe, or unless they have family or friends in a foreign country, they're probably not going to go all the way across the ocean or halfway around the world. Because odds are good they want to be able to return home someday. And it's harder to do that when you're much further away. So um, this map, by the way, is from 2011. So the data is actually probably a couple of years earlier than that. So figure 2009. So it's about seven or eight years old. The data is a little bit dated. But there are some things that you can notice. For instance, in Central Africa, there's a lot of people fleeing out of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which in right around 2009-2010 was um, still one country and there was a huge civil war going on. Right? You notice a lot of people fleeing out of Iraq, um, which is still a war zone till today. Right. Interestingly, on this, you see a lot of people fleeing into Syria. These days, you'd see a lot of people fleeing out from Syria into Iraq or Lebanon, Turkey, and the like. If you look at the inset map of um, Israel, you can see a lot of folks fleeing out into various other Arab countries. Um, and by the way, those would be Palestinians, and they're fleeing either into other Arab countries, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, <clears throat> Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, or they're fleeing into Palestinian controlled territories like the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but mostly chalk it up to cultural conflict between two groups who were trying to occupy the same lands. Okay, so when we talk about reasons for migration, 
Um, there's really two things I want to talk about as well when we talk about um, perhaps why you might stop migrating. And the slide here talks about intervening obstacles. I'm also going to talk about intervening um, opportunities. Okay, so intervening obstacles. An obstacle, of course, is something that blocks your path or blocks your progress. To intervene means to step into the middle of. Okay, so historically, a lot of these intervening obstacles were environmental. They were, you know, rivers that were too high. And the joke I was making with the B-Day kids is, you know, the river's too high, so you float your uh, wagon down it, and then you the wagon turns over, and you get dysteria, and you die, right? It's the Oregon Trail joke. But it could be rivers, it could be oceans, it could be mountains. Um, but with the advent of transportation technology, these days, environmental intervening obstacles are really pretty limited for the most part. These days, the biggest intervening obstacle tends to be money, as in you get partway to your destination and your money runs out and you can't afford to pay people to ferry you over the borders or to continue your trip. Okay. The other half of this is intervening op opportunities. So if obstacles are negative things that prevent you from migrating, opportunities are good things that prevent you from continuing your migration. Okay, and intervening opportunities are things like um, that you get a, you get the job you want partway through or you meet and marry the love of your life partway through and things like that. Okay, so opportunities are good, obstacles are bad. Okay, and then we talk about how far are people migrating. And by the way, now we're into more of Ravenstein's laws. Okay, there's two types of internal migration. Internal being within a country. Okay. Talk about inter-regional migration, movement from one region to another, or intra-regional migration, movement within a region. And underline or circle those prefixes because you're going to see them again. And one of those things you could do, really help you out in this class and a lot of other ones, is beg your English teachers to teach you um, prefixes and suffixes because it'll help you with a lot of word analysis and how to figure out what a lot of words that you don't know mean. Okay, so inter means between <clears throat> and intra means within. Okay, then when we talk about international migration. There's really two major types, voluntary, which as the name implied is implies is by choice, um, or forced, and we did talk about forced migration earlier. Um, we'd also talk about a migration transition, which is to say, um, to link it back to that demographic transition model. International migration is most common in countries that are in stage two of the demographic transition. And that kind of makes sense when you stop and think about it, because that's the stage where population is skyrocketing. And job opportunities oftentimes haven't kept pace with populations. So there's a ton of people and not enough work to go around. And so people are moving out of poor countries and into richer countries where there's more opportunities to be had. Okay, and then we talk about characteristics of migrants. Most migrants are male, most are adults, most are individuals. Families with children are a lot less common. And if you think about this stuff, it kind of to some degree makes sense. Males because um, of either a belief in protecting females or a need for females to stay home and stay with the family, maybe children or adult or elderly parents who need additional help. Adults, because um, generally speaking, it's not a good idea to send kids on their own. And individuals, because it's easier to move as a person instead of as a family. Okay, some other characteristics of migrants when we talk about gender, traditionally males have outnumbered females. Okay, in the United States um, today, and remember these numbers a little bit dated, about 55% of, of immigrants are female. There's a lot of reasons for that, but probably the biggest one is that the United States is a reasonably safe place for women to move to if they're going to move on their own. And then also when we talk about um, characteristics of immigrants, we talk about the fact that about 40% of immigrants are young adults aged 25 to 39. And typically these are folks who have maybe haven't married, who don't have houses, who um, don't have children. They don't have those things that tie them to their community and that's what makes it easy for them to move overseas. And then their earning capacity is higher during those years so they send more money back home in the form of remittances to help support elderly parents and um, younger siblings and the like. So that's been our lecture about, our lecture about migration. If you have questions, come see me.